fashion industry in Ireland alone is worth approximately 3 billion. So why is it that choosing a career in fashion is still seen as a frivolous choice, lacking in depth and seriousness? I'm creative director and stylist Courtney Smith, and in this series I'm meeting Ireland's top creative and business minds from the world of fashion. I'm on a mission to shed light on the vast spectrum of careers that the industry holds, and I'm finding out exactly what it takes to land your dream job. First up, we meet Kerry native Colin Horgan, who recently closed London Fashion Week, had his collection reviewed on Vogue.com, and, not to mention, has had Lady Gaga rocking his designs. I wanted to find out the secret to his early success. Your work is very, uh, it's very vivid, it's very you. I think, like, yeah. when you see your designs, I haven't really seen anything else like them. Where do they even come from? Where's your kind of inspiration come from? It always comes back to this idea of uh, a dangerous woman. Oh, uh, I like it. Yeah, <laughs> so it's kind of, uh, I guess it's kind of a double meaning. It's kind of like, in essence, I'm kind of creating a character, but at the same time, it's kind of my personality in it. So it's quite, it's quite visual, but also quite fun. How did Lady Gaga's team find you? Do you think it was social media or...? I have no idea because I, when I first uh, got the email I thought it might have been like a joke, <laughs> you know? I didn't know, I didn't yeah. know um, because it was very quick, you know, they wanted these pieces for like the next day and I thought this is definitely a joke, I think. I, was, I think I was at a party at the time <laughs> and uh, the next day she wore it. So uh, it was wow. quite a quick turnaround, yeah. That's pretty amazing. How many years were you like as the brand? Um, I guess officially in London, I guess maybe five months. What? Yeah. You were five months yeah. as an official brand in Lady Gaga, were you? Yeah. That's one way to cement yourself in yeah, the yeah. industry here. <laughs> well, that's what I say. Like I do, I'm quite an opportunist. So I feel yeah. like I f when you kind of feel something, you kind of, I just kind of go for it. Looking at your social media, you obviously use your Instagram as your own marketing platform. Do you think that's really important for like the next wave of designers to use that as a marketing tool? Definitely, yeah. You know, I mean, I've been contacted uh, for even commissions through Instagram, you know. I mean, mine is quite small, you know, in comparison to the following that other designers have. But I think the way I kind of curate things is quite important. Important. I try anyway. So, a well curated Instagram feed is one of the key things you need to succeed. Up next, we meet Natalie B. Coleman, who runs her design studio from North Dublin. Her collections have a strong emphasis on femininity, female empowerment, and are often suggestive with her political views. She's the new wave of designers using her powers of fashion to tell a bigger story. For people who wanted to start a, if you really wanted to start a label, I think it's kind of a crazy thing to do. It is. Yeah. It is a crazy so you're thing crazy. to do. Yeah, I, but I am. I am crazy. <laughs> I am definitely crazy. <laughs> Getting crazier by the day. I would advise people to go and work for other people and to, intern assist to intern assist like all of that and to train and get as many skills as possible before they make a decision to start a label because okay. it it can be a drain financially and emotionally. emotionally. Yeah, because it's an emotional thing, fashion, you know. Yeah. And it's, You're putting yourself into this collection in yeah. every shape and form. Yeah, and it's a lot, a lot of work as well. And it's changing. The whole fashion industry has changed so much since I started, you know, yeah. 10 years ago. I put out a call on my Instagram to ask people what they'd want to ask creatives <laughs> in the industry, whether it was designers, hair, makeup. And one of the biggest questions that came up was, what is your inspiration? So I think that's a really good one for you because obviously your designs are so eclectic and so different and they're very you. I think once you see a Natalie B. Coleman piece, you know it's a Natalie B. Coleman piece. So give us a bit of the background of what inspires you. My inspiration does change from season to season. Like it's kind of a little bit based on whatever is happening around me as well. Um, I do like a tragedy. <laughs> I like the old romantic tragedy, so I used to always do it on my relationships. And that one, all the jury I never got, which was one of my most popular kind of collections, was inspired by the fact that I had got no jewelry. And I thought growing up I was going to have, um, like my mom or something, I was going to just get, I just thought when you grow up you just get jewelry from men and da 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 da. I and, wish. Yeah, and it was before <laughs> I got married as well. And I think I'd once got a crucifix or something like that from somebody. Yeah, that doesn't so count. I was, no, that doesn't count. <laughs> so I was laughing to a friend of mine saying I should do a collection about all the jewelry I never got, you know, and that's where that idea came from. I love and that. it kind of resonated with a lot of 
women as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So I like a little bit of humor and I think as the as the label has grown, I've kind of gotten more feministic in my design direction. I don't think I'm a master of, you know, I can do small things well, but, you know, you need more people and yeah. it's more interesting and more exciting. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's it with anything, though, creatively. Yeah. You have to have other people to bring the project together. Exactly. Anyway, so you're the That's designer. what I want to do more of, collaborating yeah. with people and doing interesting projects, for yeah. sure. Teamwork is, is I think, the way Makes to the go. dream work, as the saying goes. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of teamwork, we're in London next, meeting one part of design duo Rixo. There's a common misconception that to make it as a fashion brand, you need to come from money, come from fame, or have an investor with deep pockets. And what I love about the success of Rixo is that they had none of that. They quite literally are two best friends who started designing in their own living room. We hand paint all our prints and all the prints are completely original to Rixo. These prints is all hand sketched and all the elements um, on it. So we've got like eyes. It was all like Salvador Dali inspired. So we've got little eyes and hearts and everything on it. And this is literally a labour of love. So they're all like completely hand painted and hand sketched. For anybody watching who has a dream or aspirations of bringing out their own brand, yeah. obviously we know it's not easy, but what kind of key steps do you think they could take to become the next Rexo? I mean, I think a lot of people will say it's not easy and you can't do it, but we had all that at the start. And I think if you believe in yourself, that's the biggest thing. Like, you've got to be the one driving it. I think do your market research first like, and know the industry that you're going into inside out. So even if it's menswear, or if it's jewellery, or if it's swim, so that you are doing something different. So then when you go to buyers and you go to press, you can be really confident that you've got something, do you know what, that you're really proud of. When you want to launch your own label or start your own business, that can be very expensive. So would you have any tips on that side of things? Yeah, so just don't go crazy with the overheads, I'd say, because if you've not sold a dress, then how can you afford an office? You've got to put it like that. We were embarrassed at the start. We were like, oh, we'll come and meet you. But then we were like, do you know what? Like, we're in our living room and people loved it. So we had the buyers from all over. Like, even the Brown Thomas buyers would come to us in our living room. We'd, we'd make a great cup of tea <laughs> um, and they'd buy from the living room. So it's fine. I think most people would assume that Rixo is this massive engine and that you've got a team of 50 people and, mm -hmm. and that you guys might not be as hands-on as you are, but you've got a really small team. Yeah, we've got a tiny team. Um, so this time last year, we were still literally in our living room with one person helping us do everything. And we were literally at the warehouse till six in the morning, picking and packing all the wholesale boxes to go out all over the world. So we don't outsource anything. We do everything ourselves and we're still very hands-on. We had a new girl that started with us recently and I think she, she whispered to one of the girls in the kitchen. She was like, I had no idea the girls were so hands-on. <laughs> I was like, what did you think we did? But I think no, that probably are. is a misconception from looking from the outside in. You've grown so much in three years. You've got, yeah. is it over a hundred stockists worldwide? Yeah, globally? We And we manage it all ourselves in-house, so yeah. Part of what the success of Rixo has mm -hmm. been, aside from the yeah. gorgeous clothes that I want all of them, yeah. um, is, is the business side, because it is a business at the yeah, end of the day. Of so would you say, you know, designers that are watching this or, or buyers that are watching this, mm -hmm. that it would be helpful to do something like a business management course like you guys did? Definitely. I think you've got to really know your end price point, what you want to price at, and who's buying the product as well. Like, you've really got to think about your customer. Like, even when designing, if you're not thinking about the end customer and who, who's wearing it, where she's wearing it to, can she afford that price point, is she taking it on holiday? Like, it's all about the customer. So I'd say to anyone, just think about your customer and just be like, would you actually, if you had your own money, would you buy that? Because everything we do, we are so passionate. Do you know what I'm like? I'm like, oh, God, if, if Rixo wasn't us, we'd be bankrupt. <laughs> I'm like, we'd want it all. So you've really got to kind of know your customer inside out. From London to New York, Irish creatives are taking over the world. We're in the fashion district meeting designer Don O'Neill, who's dressed some of the biggest global stars, including Oprah Winfrey. So I just had to find out what his career highlights been. Well, I have to say it's tinged with royalty and the, and the highlight would be dressing the Duchess of Sussex. That for me was a dream. I mean, we're only a few weeks out from it having happened and I'm still pinching myself. When I see that image of her wearing the dress, I am, it's, I can't believe she's wearing my dress. She's the most talked about, photographed fashion icon in the world right now. And to think that I dressed her is just off the charts. Can you get into it later in life without having studied it? Uh, yes, and I see people nodding in the room that have done that. Yeah. Um, in the studio this season, we had a wonderful intern from Dublin. Uh, Maggie would be the same age as I am, but wow. going back into fashion now, which, we, which was amazing. And for her, being here was like being in a, 
a wonderland to be in the heart of the studio and the project she got to do. She's very interested in textile, so for her it was exploring a new world, but at her age, back at school, following her true passion, finally, which I applaud her. But not everybody that studies fashion design makes it a career in the end. Um, I suppose it's a very tough career to break into. So what would you say, I suppose, was that turning point for you, that, like from student designer to professional designer? I think I was fearless uh, or naive. I'm not sure whether it was fearless <laughs> or naive or clueless. Or a bit of both. But when I graduated <laughs> in Dublin, um, there was a, a guest designer from London that was showcasing with us, sort of to draw the crowd to see the, the students from the college graduate. And Gina Fertini was her name, who was a very well-known designer in Dublin. And she had a big trunk show that weekend at Brown Thomas. And it was a big hoopla around her. And I was fortunate enough, I won Designer of the Year. And Gina presented the, the prize. And afterwards, backstage, she congratulated me. And the first thing I said to her, it was sort of, thank you, can I have a job? And I, and I, I guess it was very forthright. And I was really nervous. But I just, like, I just thought the logical step was I would love to go work for her in London. And she was very sweet and said, well, if ever you're in London, um, do pop in and see us and, and maybe we could offer you an internship or something. So I took that as a please come and intern for me. <laughs> and I lit, that's what I did. I, just, I didn't even think about looking for a job in Dublin. I just immediately moved to London and showed up on Gina's doorstep. I'm like, I'm here. And she's like, great. <laughs> I didn't actually offer you a job, but OK, come and, on in. And there I stayed for like four or five months with Gina as an intern while I looked for my first real paid fashion job in London. So it all worked out. But I just think the turning point was just a mixture of bravery and maybe a little bit of naivete. But I just knew where I wanted to go. And I just was a little bit, I guess you just put the blinders on and you just go straight for what you want. And that's what I did. And did you find that internship invaluable? Internships are invaluable and it really helped me at that time in London because I had just come out of college and was very naive. I didn't know how the industry worked. And that few months that I had spent with Gina, I got to do pattern making, designing, but I got to watch her pattern makers. I got to watch Gina designing. I got to see her sales team, how they worked. I got to see the real inner workings of a design company, which you don't see in college unless you do internships. Mm. And we're surrounded by interns here who I hope are gaining valuable experience here at Thea because you get to do real jobs. You mightn't be paid, but you're, you're gaining valuable experience, which is really, really important. And it, it lets you know if, you, if this is really for you, if this is what you want to do. You get to explore different areas. It's all really important. And do you have any advice for aspiring designers out there that want to become the next Don O'Neill? You really need to be prepared to follow your dreams and work very hard. Um, it's, not, it's not as simple as it looks like. It's not going on Pinterest and finding a dress that you like and thinking, I'll make that in purple and I'm a designer. There is so much you can learn in college. Um, you need to know how to make a garment. You need to know how to make a pattern. You need to be able to tell the people around you how to bring your dreams to life. Um, and you need to be creative. You need to be out there. You need to be inspiring yourself. There are so many steps that are really important that are small steps. And take it easy, step by step. You don't have to be me overnight. It just took me 30 years. So maybe you could speed it up a little <laughs> bit. But basically, it's, it's, it's a slow process, but it's a layering process. And every skill you learn, everything you experience, it just, it all sort of fills your purse. And eventually, one day, you'll get to where I am, hopefully. Someone who knows a thing or two about perseverance is designer Katie Ann, who rejected the popular route of interning to start her own label straight out of college. Her collections have landed her incredible reviews on Vogue.com and had stars like Paloma Faith requesting to wear her line, proving there's no right or wrong route into becoming a designer. Okay, so let's talk money because obviously it's not easy to finance all of this. So. What advice would you have when people want to start up their own business in fashion? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, if you want to do it, you'll find a way of doing it. Like, I've taken out personal loans in my own name to make it happen. It's really difficult. It's a big commitment. But when I have that finished garment in my hand and it's on my rack in the studio ready, it's, I love it. It's the best feeling. And where do you get your inspiration from? Because your garments are so distinctive and distinctively yours. Yeah. Which is quite strange. I love photography. So I would always start off a collection with kind of like a rough idea of what to look at. Like past collections, I looked at a photographer that went into Ukraine prison. So it was about boys and it's about mood and it's about like attitude in photos. So from little details in the photos, like their pocket details or their silhouettes or the print on a wall. So I'll take that and just run with it. You're obviously very creative, you mm -hmm. create your own collections, yeah. but the business side of the fashion industry and the business side of fashion designing 
is very difficult. So like it's been a learning curve like it's only now like a year and a half down the line I've signed up with sales agencies and PR people people that know and that have years of experience behind them to guide and help you as well. So yeah, it's just been a massive learning curve. It's fair to say becoming a successful designer is no easy feat, but combining talent, drive and passion, anything can be achieved. 